Am I in the end? I'm just gonna sit closer. I feel like I'm so far away. My, my microphone's molesting me. I'm gonna hold it so it doesn't touch me. As long as I don't move, it's okay. Otherwise, it's gonna molest me. I don't. I don't know how you get yours something like that. What? Just like sags down. Strength element. Strength elements. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm gonna put uh, requirements. It's been a long day, all right? All right, guys, welcome. In this video, we're gonna run you guys through how we teach the Bar Muscle Up. Uh, a couple of things that we pay attention to. You got skill acquisition, your strength requirements, prerequisite strengths that we have a look for before we try and progress clients onto some of these other skills. And then we have our pattern tracing as well. Now, first thing that we start with is generally gonna be pattern tracing. If we have ticked all the boxes, we do tend to shift clients towards the jump series. We start with the basic mechanics around entry. So entry being how we start the repetitions, jumping into that muscle up, the shake that we acquire in the air, right? How we actually make contact with the bar, what shape we maintain, where we have uh, tension, how we hold the positions, and then how we generate momentum, which is gonna help us up in that vertical, dire vertical direction to eventually end up over the bar. Now, in this video, we very quickly touch on the hip to bar. All right, we don't necessarily touch on the jump to pike or jump to hollow. If you do want any of that more uh, progressive approach to the jump to series, this is actually a full series of movements that you can run as a primer or warm up even if you have bar muscle ups. All right, we do have that on our YouTube. Feel free to check that one out. We'll link that in the top left or the top right for you guys. The next one that we utilize is the single leg box muscle up. You can run this as a double leg variation. So if you do find that you're having a hard time generating power from the lower limbs, you can use both legs. The goal of this drill is basically replacing the kip, allowing you to slow down and focus on your positions as we get ourselves up towards the bar and then being able to generate rotation, sit over, receive, and then complete the movement at the top. I think it also adds like a massive confidence builder. One of the things you were talking about earlier, Michael, is that uh, for our next drill, which is gonna be the banded muscle up or the low bar turnover, having the box and forcing the athlete to jump to a higher height will allow them to gain some of that confidence of going to a rig or a position they might not be used to. One of the first things I ever said when I got my first bar muscle up was, holy shit, how high up am I? How do I get down? What's the safest way to, to come back down? And it's just because for a lot of people, this will be higher than they'll ever go. They won't feel like they have control as it is their very first repetition or they're learning to get that first repetition. But I think the single leg box jump drill is a great way to introduce that height element of the bar muscle up that and most people don't It's think definitely about. something that's not spoken about. There is that fear factor kicking up for a handstand for the first time has the same thing. Generally, injuries come from hesitation. So we're trying to iron that out. So we're trying to remove any hesitation, build some confidence with the client, and then we can progress them into the harder drills that they can tackle. Uh, moving into the next drill that we select, this is based off that principle or that yeah. focus slash framework. If we do find that the client is having a hard time with confidence, right, their movements are quite slow, they're very hesitant, maybe they're freezing at the top, so they're scared to rotate over the bar, then we move them into the low bar turnover. So in that scenario, if I'm coaching a client, I would move them to the low bar turnover where they can still practice getting around the bar, but we remove that fear factor and we run that in conjunction conjunction with the single leg box muscle up probably for about two to four weeks. If anything, I just see clients running it not long enough. All right, so we are in control of the timeline that we set around these goals. They'll run it for a week and then they expect to get a muscle up. Yeah, as where learning a new skill takes time. So they might need to do this two to three times per week for 10 to 15 minutes a day. All right, and then try and have that for four weeks before they even change the drill. All right, repetition is something that bodybuilders use a lot and it's definitely something that we need to utilize with our clients from a coaching point of view. Novelty is something that CrossFit's kind of built around and it is almost a bit of a hindrance when we look at skill acquisition for clients because they come in and they're like, oh, but I'm bored of that drill. Well, you have to run it for four weeks to kind of learn the basics around it. It might take you the first two weeks to be able to execute it properly and now you've only got two weeks of progressive overload for that movement. And then same with like double unders, you see that being like a like almost like the crux of everyone's, bane of everyone's existence. They're like, they'll do a double under session once every fortnight in class. They might not practice it for two weeks. They get around to a double under session. Shit, why am I still shit at double unders? It's because I've done no training in between that. It'd be the same idea. If you, if you just continuously work on the drill for four weeks, four week period, you're going to become an expert in that particular skill, which means you're going to build confidence in your ability to do the other movements successfully because you've nailed at least one portion of the movement. 
at least turning over and having more confidence being higher. That's the same with the banded muscle ups. We're talking about it as well. It's not only just a great drill for people who don't have the strength at the stage or potentially just don't have some of the awareness ability to be able to get their hips high enough or turn over fast enough. The, the bands give them a little bit of extra oomph to get over that bar, but turn that to the other side, people who already have tons of muscle ups, this also might be a great drill to get more volume in the muscle ups just like an assisted pull-up machine, even if you can already do pull-ups. We were talking about it before. If we want to run capacity and we look at some of the constraints, we often hear, oh, my hand's ripped, or oh, I couldn't handle this. They're generally going to rip from friction. If we can reduce the amount of friction that someone's going through by reducing their body weight, especially if you're working with some of the heavier guys, like the 95, 100 kilo athletes, it's not a bad strategy to run that. Run like repeat sets of 10, but they're running two red bands to try and mitigate at least 10 to 15% of their body weight work on their turnover, work on their positions, and then have high volume to make sure that they're retaining that. Yeah. It's not one to two good reps out of a set of 10. And why do we use the two bands crossed over rather than just the single band in the center? It's for pattern recognition. So we want to express the pattern that we're most likely going to express when we do the muscle up. And if we run a single band, it restricts our kit. If we have a look at the arch and the ability to come through, generally it will teach you a shorter kit because you're getting slapped in the face. Yeah. All right. So we will always say if we're going to utilize bands in a scenario, you're always going to run two and you're going to run it across the body so that it doesn't restrict your kip in pattern. And, I mean, it's also unhygienic to get a band in the face too, looking at those bands. <laughs> you don't know where the band's been. <laughs> but, well, moving on to the next portion, strength requirements. What would you say are some good strength requirements and why are they important to be able to get that first bar muscle up? So just break down some of the, the movements that or the discipline that's required there. We're looking at pull-up strengths. We normally run three to five as a bit of a guide. If someone's got a very rough set of three, we'd probably try and incentivize them to get towards five. That's a little bit of a hyperextension. It's a bit of a shimmy, all right, questionable reps to get to the three. Yeah. That's why we run a range. We don't necessarily have a fixed number. And then we move into four to 10 toaster bar, all right, four to 10 kipping pull-ups if they've got their kipping patterns. Yeah. And then one body weight ring dip. Now. One body weight ring dip, we are looking for it to be more of a tempo, full range repetition. All right, if we do progress some of our progressions towards the rings, you are going to be receiving in a deep position. Yeah. And generally on a bar muscle up, something that again isn't really touched on, that first repetition sometimes can be a chicken wing mm -hmm. and it can be a very deep catch all right, or low catch position where you are going to have a little bit more stress on the shoulder and that connective tissue. We want to make sure that we have the adequate strength to be able to tolerate that and not end up injured and then not able to run the drills for the four weeks that we need to. 100%. And even talking about chicken wings, I always find the chicken wing most times, nine out of 10 times, isn't just because one arm is favoring. One arm favors due to just your body's ability to kind of compensate on the moment. But a lot of times you'll watch people who chicken wing and normally they don't have that hip drive portion of their movement under track. So if you look at someone who does a jump to toe to bar or jump to toe rise versus a jump to hip drive, you're like cutting out maybe this much space between you and the bar and your body's gonna make that up somehow. Normally it results to using the arms. Most people aren't symmetrical, so they'll just go for that stronger side. We do see from time to time the athlete who just has one of the sides that tend to favor due to one of the hips rising on one of those sides. And that's a different story. We have a drill on our channel called the mixed grip turnover that we've used to quite a good effect for those guys who just have one hip rising versus the other. But that's more of a unique scenario. Not all individuals will fit into that. We find most of the time it's just a lack of hip drive in that final portion of the movement. And then they're trying to close the gap by just using their arms. And eventually that's going to lead to some chicken wings and those deep catches. Just a compensation. It's, it's a workaround and the constraints different for everyone. So you, like you said, you might have someone where it's starting early. You might have someone where it's starting late. It might be a mobility issue. And those things are only going to be identified when you work with a coach and they slow things down and they've seen it before. They'll go, okay, sweet. You actually have a lack of glute activation through one side. So we need to prime that, get that glute firing a little bit more, hold some tighter positions, and then all of a sudden there's no chicken wing. Speaking of glute activation, one of our next drills that we go through is the front lever extension, or there's a dynamic version of the same movement. Both of these I find, uh, just like Michael said, for some of the guys who don't either don't know how to activate their glutes or maybe aren't as aware or have the ability to use their lats to the biggest advantage possible, this is a isometric hold position where the goal is looking at tensing the glutes and the lats at the same time, maintaining that hip to bar position for as long as possible. And what it's doing is when we are going through that jump two series and we're going for the hips to bar, we're activating the correct muscles to get you as high as possible. 
when I do this drill prior to muscle ups, my hip portion of the muscle up is so much better and I'm almost having to catch myself over the rig because I'm flying so high. Yeah, you're increasing blood flow, you're increasing neural drive, so you're more likely to express the pattern, but you're also gonna do it faster. When you are cueing it or your mind's telling your muscle to contract, that signal's just prime. It's ready to go. And then the dynamic version is just looking at doing it from a bit more of a realistic standpoint where we're not gonna be holding that position in reality. The dynamic version, we add a roller under our legs and we just get to move through what would technically be that hollow position coming into the hips to bar portion of the movement. And we're just looking to see if we can activate the lats and the glutes simultaneously. And that's just gonna have a good carryover to our jump to hip to bar for those guys who just can't figure it out when they're doing it dynamically. It slows it down a little bit. It takes off some pressure. It feels a bit nicer. And then lastly, we do our weighted plank. So we run this with the weight belt, a kettlebell. Now, general rule of thumb is you wanna be able to hold at least a minute starting at probably 16 kilos. We would suggest being able to build up to 24 kilos for 60 seconds on this one. You can run it in conjunction with side planks, but that's generally not specific to the muscle up, but it will help your bracing in general for other movements. If you're ready there doing the drill, you may as well just add that extra in there. Yeah. It does have a little bit of setup because you've got to have the two boxes, plus you got to get the weight belt, plus you got to get the kettle kettlebell out. So bang for buck, I would suggest adding the side planks in. This one here is what we utilize in replace of some of the hollow holds, just because when we're queuing or we're giving these drills, especially from a, a online perspective, we're not there to give feedback. So if someone's out of position, not bracing, or they've got an arch, or they lack their pelvis posterior tilt, uh, tilt they don't have that control, we can't cue that. So we use this drill because it incentivizes that position and it gives more feedback for the individual. And it can also be just good in general, like a replacement for a plank. A lot of people, when they plank, they don't, they don't know what their position is doing to them. They don't know where they're sitting. And unless you're recording yourself, you stop, you watch, you come back, it can be quite challenging without a coach there to put you in the correct position. The kettlebell kind of drags you down and forces you to have to brace hard because if you don't, you're going to end up just kissing the ground with your hips. Um, and they're going to let that kettlebell sag too low. So it is punishing. It looks challenging when Michael was doing it. Thank God I didn't demonstrate it but it is a good replacement and allows us to at least focus on those bracing mechanics while we are performing such a dynamic movement. Lastly, for the athlete that this probably works most for, it's the mobile athlete. So the mobile athlete is generally gonna be an athlete that's able to be a little bit more passive, a little bit more naturally. They're probably the person who doesn't necessarily need to warm up too much and they have a nice full depth squat, right? They've got good range of motion through their hamstrings. And then it comes to the bracing side of things where they need to be stiff and rigid and they need to control tension and absorb momentum and they just lack the awareness around that, this drill fits in really well for them. Awesome. If you are someone who struggles with toes to bar, pull-ups, those prerequisite strengths are a bit more of a challenge for you and you aren't quite at that stage to get those covered off, do be sure to check out our pull-up and our toe to bar program on our website, umdownathletic.com.au slash shop. Otherwise, we do have our own muscle-up program as well. If you want some more progressive skills, you want it in a formatted way that allows you to follow it for a six-week progression that'll help you get to that first muscle-up. And if you already have them, help you improve and get more volume uh, in your muscle-ups and for your workouts. And that pull-up program is absolutely free. So if you don't have one, jump on, run it. It's about six to eight weeks, all right? And then flick us a message. Fantastic. Well, that's going to cover off our video for how we teach the bar muscle-up. Any questions, queries, or qualms, comment down below. Otherwise, we'll see you on the next video.